So for the focus of uh, the workshop today, we're, we're really going to be talking about the SUNY OSCAR rubric. Uh, everyone should be seeing my screen here. Can you give me a little heads up if that's the case? I think I'm not going to take these slides full screen because I'm going to pop back and forth between some different windows. Hopefully they're all um, large enough graphics and so forth that we don't need to go into presentation mode. So the focus of the talk, of the talk, discussion today is this OSPR rubric. It's the Open SUNY Course Quality Review Rubric, if I remember correctly. I've always just called it OSCAR for the last several years. Um, it's a, um, there are a number of, uh, thanks Marie, there's a number of um, other online course design rubrics that have been developed in the past. We have for a while used the Quality Matters rubric, but we're switching over to promoting the SUNY OSCAR rubric for a couple of reasons. A, it's been developed by SUNY, so yay, home team. Uh, but also uh, SUNY has made it openly licensed and so anyone is free to use it. Uh, technically, uh, the Quality Matters rubric is a commercial product. As we'll look through, it really covers a lot of the aspects of, of what you need to take in mind for when you are uh, designing your course. But as opposed to the Quality Matters rubric, it also covers some of the aspects of, of um, delivering your course, not just designing your course. So, um, there is a nice introductory video at the SUNY OSCAR site that you can go to. Oh, let me, let me make a point back here. Uh, the slides we're showing today are available at this bit.ly link if you want to access them later. And Rebecca and I will both be adding uh, some additional slides to cover some of the live parts of the session that we'll be going through today. So, uh, mostly I encourage you all to just go to the OSCAR rubric and start looking at it and playing around with it. Before I get into introducing some of the framework for the OSCAR rubric though, and then we talk about some of the specific standards. I mean, there are 50 standards, so we clearly don't have time to go through all of them today. That's why I encourage you all to, to um, um, explore on your own. I do want to pull, go through a, a few slides to provide a little bit of um, framing, framing uh, framework around what we want to talk about today. So one framework that I oftentimes use when I'm working with faculty to develop uh, online courses in particular, but many of these things also apply to blended and face-to-face -face courses as well is this community of inquiry model that's been uh, developed over the last couple of decades to really provide a framework for how to develop a successful community of learners online. And they boil it down to these three presences that you need to take into account. One is the idea of social presence. Do students feel, do students in this online course feel like they have a way to express themselves, their thoughts, their perspectives, in a way that makes them feel part of this online uh, community of learners. So that's important. If you go um, to actually look at the model, there's you know, more specific definitions of each of these, which I didn't bother um, copying over on the slide. Another very important thing for our online courses is the issue of teaching presence. Okay. So I don't know about you, but I've sat in on online courses where there's just been a whole bunch of stuff put up online. The instructor is essentially AWOL. There's no, no timely feedback. There's no interaction with the instructor. Those, those kinds of online courses are deadly. I mean, imagine having a face-to-face -face course where the students come in and all they see is a, an hour-long video that's displayed up on the screen and there's no way to interact with the instructor. Uh, that wouldn't be very satisfying either. And then the third is the cognitive presence, which 
is a little bit more difficult to wrap your head around, but uh, I mean, it's essentially how has the course been designed in order to provide an opportunity for students to, you know, work through these materials and um, connect the ideas and so forth. So we've got the students, we've got the, the faculty member, and we've got the, the, the course design elements coming together. When I'm talking with faculty, I oftentimes talk about a different set of interactions. This is not specifically part of the community of inquiry model, but I mean, when I'm thinking about putting my course online, I'm thinking, well, who are the students interacting with? Well, they're interacting with the course content, they're interacting with me, and uh, in most courses, they're also interacting with each other, with other students. So that's an important framework to keep in mind. I wanted to uh, pull up this classic, Seven Principles for Good Practice in Undergraduate Education. If you're not aware of this paper from, oh, at this point it must be like 30 years ago, it's a very classic uh, uh, framing article by Chickering and Gamson, there are several rules for good practice. Basically, um, Research shows that students perform best when there are ways for uh, mechanisms in the course that encourage the students to interact with the instructor. There are mechanisms in the course that encourage students to interact with each other, that uh, encourage active learning on the part of students rather than having them just sit back and take in content. Students learn best when they're given prompt feedback, and frankly, given my schedule, that's the one that I struggle with the most. It's hard. It's that is hard. hard. They have a long, yeah. yeah. Uh, things that encourage students to spend time on task. The more time they are working with the material, the more time they're struggling with the content, working through problems, whatever, the better they're gonna learn. Um, Communicating high expectations on the part of the instructor. If you don't expect them to do much, guess what? They don't, do they don't do much. And then respecting diverse talents and ways of learning. Now that these principles were dev developed with the uh, face-to-face courses in mind. As we think about blended courses or online courses, we want to think about, well, how do we apply these principles to the online environment as well? And then finally, the last kind of framing principle is uh, the uh, Bloom's taxonomy. This is actually only one of uh, Bloom's taxonomies. This is Bloom's taxonomy for the cognitive domain. Hopefully, most of you are aware of this, but I'm surprised. Well, I don't want to say surprised, but I, I work with a lot of faculty who who have not been taught as educators, right? They've been they've been taught as as experts in their disciplines. Yeah and haven't come across this, the idea that we, we need to think about what's the proper balance between lower order thinking skills, to what extent are we just asking our students to remember and understand ideas versus higher order thinking skills, you know, where they're actually analyzing and creating and synthesizing uh, the content. So uh, lots, low, lower order thinking skills and HOTS, higher order thinking skills. And if you're teaching an introductory course, it's perfectly appropriate for most of your learning outcomes for the course to be lower order thinking skills. But if you're teaching an upper level course, you wanna make sure you've got some balance. You'll still need to have uh, outcomes in your course that are you know, basic, do you understand the frameworks for the course? But for our upper level courses, we wanna make sure the students are analyzing and evaluating and synthesizing material. Okay, so that's a quick uh, overview of some of the background. Um, let me talk a little bit more about the Oscar rubric. I'll um, pull up a few standards that I wanna present. Rebecca will talk about some of the standards she wants to present. If uh, I pop over to the Oscar site, and there are actually two different, if you do a search for SUNY Oscar, you'll, you'll pick up an oscar.org site, which is not actually under the ownership of SUNY anymore. 
it still is an Oscar site, but I would probably recommend you go to the SUMI site. Um, one of the options here is to get Oscar. And so uh, I'd recommend you go there. You can just download a PDF of the Oscar rubric. If you click on this link, it'll take you to the uh, Online Learning Consortium site. SUNY uh, has been in a partnership with the OLC uh, organization for a while, although we're um, not quite as joined at the hip with them as we have been. And so SUNY contributed the Oscar rubric to the set of rubrics that are maintained by the uh, Online Learning Consortium. So you can click out, you can click on this link, uh, fill out a form and download a PDF. If you do that, um, you'll see all of the 50 standards um, maybe um, listed in order uh, under their different categories. And the one thing I like about the Oscar rubric is that it's not just a is this standard met or not kind of thing, the way the uh, quality matters and some other rubrics are. Instead, it's, a, it's an issue of, well, let's list these standards. So the course includes a welcome and getting started content. Uh, that's certainly applicable. And you know, if it's sufficiently present, you're done. But the nice thing about the Oscar rubric is says, well, you know, I, I got a welcome message, but I really don't have sufficient directions to let students get started. So I need to work on that. Well, how long is that going to take me? Is it going to take me, this is a minor revision where it's going to take, to take me a little bit of time? So the Oscar rubric's not only a listing of here are the important things you be, should be thinking about for your course, but it also allows you to set up a work plan. What do I need to do a lot of work on to get fixed or to get ready? What's, what's there already? What just needs minor tweaks? And I find that aspect of the rubric uh, quite useful. And you can even you know, put in an action plan. You can say over here, well, uh, my welcome's fine in engaging, but I need to lay out the steps, whatever you need to do. So that's an option. I would actually recommend, though, that you click on this link to uh, generate your online inter interactive ru rubric. This will ask you for your uh, email address and the name of the course and then it will create a Google Doc of this so you have a live document online that you can copy over into your Google Drive assuming most of us live in the Google universe and um, then you can um, you know just fill out everything there in a, in a more live kind of format Okay, so what I want to do now is just provide an overview to the standards, then I will pull up live a few of the standards to talk about. We'll switch over to Rebecca. She can talk about some of the standards that deal with accessibility. We'll deal with questions as they come along here. So, as I said, there are 50 standards that um, Open SUNY developed when they're putting this Oscar rubric together, and they've organized them into these six different major areas. So there is, uh, there are 10 standards that deal with course overview and information, like getting started, uh, course objectives, campus policies, principal syllabus, and so forth. I'll go through a couple of these uh, just because I want to point out some of the aspects of how the each of these standards is laid out. The next set of course technology tools. Obviously, if we're dealing with an online course, it's going to be technology mediated. That's going to be a barrier for some students that we want to make sure is less of a barrier. And so there are these five standards that deal with technology. Uh, I don't think, I'm not planning to talk about any of them today. I don't think you are. I'm going to talk about standard 15. 15, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do that now while we're here? No, or? we can. Okay. There is this design and layout. Um, 
that deals with all sorts of nuts and bolts of actual uh, online web page development and how that applies to our courses. Um, there's a standard on blinking text, which uh, I don't see a lot of blinking text anymore, unfortunately. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about course navigation and how it relates to our Moodle courses. Um, content and activities. I think, Rebecca, you're talking about a number of the standards in here. Uh, I want to talk um, about higher order thinking and authentic activities and open educational resources and interaction. Won't talk about any of these in detail, but if you go back to those framing, those frameworks that I talked about with, you know, is there an opportunity for students to have ex ex express their social presence? Are you in there as an instructor? These standards deal with those kinds of interactions and are, are very important. And then finally, the assessment and feedback. I mean, going back to that good principle of providing prompt feedback. What does that mean in an online course environment? Uh, and here are these seven standards that kind of relate to that. Okay. So that's that's an overview of the uh, of the rubric. Uh, are there any questions at this point? What's blinking text? <laughs> That's kind of old school. Okay. Is that old school PowerPoint? So uh, if you go to design and layout and then, uh, click on the blinking like text standards, oh, right. you see okay. flashing and blinking text are avoided. Oh, sure. Don't do it. This is an they easy used standard. To do it in PowerPoint. This <laughs> used to be, yeah, yeah. This used yeah. to be the sort of a holdover from the early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. No, no, yeah. Some people, some people, some people are still red attached. Red blinking text. We, you'd be surprised what we see. Yeah. That's so um, let me just run through a few of these standards. I want to um, pull up a couple of them initially just to show you what's actually provided here in the Oscar rubric. So if we go to getting started. Um, course includes a welcome and getting started content. So um, you want to think about, well, how, how are you going to implement this in your course in Moodle? And I would actually probably recommend that you have, you add a page resource, resource, resource to your Moodle course that says, you know, welcome, getting started, however you want to phrase it. It's very easy for you to record a video, pop it up onto YouTube. Rebecca might say some things about captioning. <laughs> Start with a script. <laughs> Start with a script Makes your life easier. so that it's easier to caption. And actually, I was going to mention script because, I mean, once you've got that video up on YouTube, we tend not to w encourage faculty to put a whole lot of large videos in Moodle itself because Moodle's not a good video streaming platform. But I've got my YouTube channel. I put a lot of YouTube, a lot of my videos up on YouTube. I either make them public or I make them unlisted. If you are hesitant about putting your videos up on your YouTube channel, make them unlisted. No one will find them randomly. But Moodle, you can still tell Moodle where that video is, and Moodle makes it very easy for you to put that video into your into your page. Now, if you start with a script. On that page, you can also put the script itself right there, yeah. as well as putting it in the captions. And I would also add that because the um, because the onus in terms of work for these online courses can seem daunting, I would suggest that it, you know you definitely start with a script because it'll make you more organized. It'll help you with the accessibility side, but also be careful when you're doing that not to say you know welcome to the fall semester <laughs> so that you can use it again and then you don't have that same level of the so I actually want to go to um, standard nine here about course objectives to talk a little bit more about what is actually provided in each of these standards. So the standard itself is just course objectives outcomes are clearly defined, measurable, and aligned to learning activities or assessments. That's just our that's just our practice these days, regardless whether you're teaching online or face to face. But the nice thing about the Oscar rubric is that 
Well, it has a little video about an instructor talking about this standard and how she meets that standard, how she incorporates it into her thoughts about course design. It's got not just thou shalt do this kind of the standard, but well, why? W you know, what, what, why is this important? What are the references here? Oh, Provides. That's my favorite, to refresh your course with these ideas. Refresh your course with ideas, exactly. So, what does this mean? Certainly, you're mapping the uh, course, you're, you're listing the course out objectives and outcomes, but, you know, this gives you an opportunity to map all of your content you're presenting to those standards. Do you actually need to present all that content? Is there stuff that you've just been presenting for out of habit? Same thing with avoid busy work or assignments not aligned with stated outcomes. In our face-to-face -face classes or in our online courses, why give students assignments to do if those assignments aren't helping the students to attain the outcomes of the course? So going through these, each of these standards has a refresh your course with these ideas section. Very useful to go through. Um, it's got various resources that you can explore uh, further. Uh, SUNY has a relationship with the University of Central Florida to uh, submit tools and teaching tips to this teaching online pedagogy, pedagogical repository. So this is your kind of tips and tricks of, of things that you can do online, many of which you can apply to your face-to-face -face or blended courses as well. So the, the rubric is more than just the listing of the standards and whether you've met them or not. Each one of these standards has a whole variety of resources that you can draw on when you're designing or when you are delivering your course. So, um, let me, I want to make sure I give Rebecca sufficient time. So let me just go through uh, quickly some of these other standards. And again, I would just ex invite you all to go to the OSCAR site, explore the rubrics, or the standards as they're presented on the site, uh, download a copy of the rubric as a PDF or a Google Doc, and start applying that to your courses. Um, in terms of course design and layout, I think the only one I want to talk about is course navigation here. And the, the, the only thing I want to talk about here is that in some respects, Moodle makes course navigation easy because its default is just to lay out the course in sequence from the top of the course page to the bottom. You have a choice of whether you want to lay out your course in terms of uh, weeks you follow your calendar or whether you want to do a sequence of topics those can be selected in the um, course settings actually I probably should have popped up a Moodle window which I won't take the time to do now uh, you do have the problem of if your course gets a very elaborate it, your Moodle course page can get very very long you have the issue with the Moodle scroll of death um, phenomenon you have an option of um, laying out your series of, say, topic sections and having Moodle only display one section at a time. That's an option you can select in the course settings where the front page of your course just lists the topics and the uh, section descriptions and gives students a link to go to topic four where they can see everything you've laid out for topic four. You just have to be a little bit careful that students actually realize that there's more than the front page of your Moodle and course. And it can also get cluttered if you have a lot of tabs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so there's, there's some issues there about how this standard of course navigation maps out onto a Moodle course. Um, I want to say uh, a couple of things about higher order, order thinking. Going back to you know, the presentation on blooms that we quickly did earlier, you want to make sure that you've got sufficient level of higher order thinking activity, uh, activities in your course to match up the level of your course. So if, again, if it is an upper level course, 
it shouldn't all just be low level, lower, lower order thinking skills that are being uh, addressed in the course. This really, and they, they use the uh, community of inquiry language here, cognitive presence. This is where you would really you know, figure out how students, how you're designing the course in order to allow students to engage, engage appropriately with the course content. Um, so I would, I would direct you to, to look at this standard. It refers to Bloom's taxonomy, goes through uh, critical thinking, cognitive presence, how you can really implement that in an online, uh, in an online course. I would also point out authentic activities. One issue that oftentimes comes up with uh, online courses is, well, I've been teaching my course and typically I have a final that is multiple choice questions and how do I keep people, how do I keep students from cheating on those? How do I keep them from uh, looking up? Well, if you've got your course structured around authentic activities where you're assigning real world projects that the students have to apply your course concepts to, that becomes much less of an issue. And those applications to real world concepts also provide a good way to engage, especially adult learners. You know, adult learners are less interested in taking multiple choice questions uh, than they are in terms of working on projects that they can see apply to real world situations. So, I mean, this, this ties in with applied learning, it ties in with experiential learning, this idea of really having authentic problem-based activities as part of your course um, to give students a real authentic way to show what they have, what they've learned in your course is important, I think. Uh, I can't uh, do a session these days without making some reference to open educational resources, especially for our online courses. Um, using OER materials can have multiple benefits. Um, you don't have to worry about students taking five weeks into the semester for their, for their financial aid to come through for them to be able to buy a textbook. SUNY ha and the state of New York has invested a lot in helping faculty to adopt OER materials. Uh, I just want to point out that if you go to oer.suny.edu, and then Marie, if you can pop that link into the chat, uh, you will see the catalog of what SUNY OER Services calls ready to adopt courses. So the easiest way for us as faculty to begin adopting OER materials is just to say, well, instead of buying a per commercial textbook, I'm going to go to SUNY OER Services and see if there's an appropriate textbook available. So I'm teaching human anatomy and physiology. Uh, so instead of buying, having my students buy a $250 textbook, they have access to this textbook, openly licensed textbook that was developed at Carnegie Mellon through the Open Learning Initiative. Oftentimes, these online texts, if you see something that's tagged as uh, a Lumen Waymaker course. It will have personalized and adaptive learning materials online. Uh, it's not just a textbook, but it's uh, your activities, quizzes, and so forth. Same thing with the o OLI materials. Uh, OHM is online homework manager, so many of the math and STEM courses have a lot of test banks and homework problems and so forth. And if you see an OER, a uh, SUNY OER text that's tagged OHM, same thing. Okay. I actually think OER is not just a convenience for our, fact, for our students. And, um, but it's really, it really becomes an equity issue. I mean, we have students who have trouble affording these, exp these expensive textbooks. By adopting 
well vetted, high quality OER materials. We help support e equitable access to all of our students. It also gives you much more flexibility as an instructor to customize and repurpose your course materials. It's not like you've bought a $250 textbook and you feel like you have to cover every chapter in that textbook because, my gosh, students have spent $250 on it. SUNY OER services will, will very kindly help you mix and match different uh, OER materials from different sections to put together uh, an openly licensed text that really fits with how you want to teach the course. And ultimately, you can even involve your students in developing course materials as part of this that they themselves openly license that you can then use in subsequent terms. And now you've got students developing, co-creating the content that then gets taught to future generations. And that's real active and problem-based learning. So active problem-based learning, it's open pedagogy, it's involving, it's democratizing your classroom, it has all of these you know, nice, uh, nice buzzwords around it. So I'm assuming that SUNY has vetted a lot of their OERs in terms of accessibility. Everything. Just to note that not all OERs yeah. um, are fully accessible. So if you're going to adopt anything for your class, it is something that you're going to have to yeah. kind of take a look at. Everything that is listed here is not only openly licensed, but is been vetted for accessibility. But we put in the chat window also the live guide that we had created, which might link them out to some other yeah. uh, collections yeah. as well, if you don't find what you're looking for. Um, I, uh, like I say, I won't pull up a lot of these standards in particular, but the standards here under interaction really do address those issues of how do you develop an online community of learners and scholars? How do you encourage students to uh, make use of peer interactions as they're um, cre creating their understanding of the material? How do you facilitate your instructor presence in the course? All of these things are very important to have a course where students are engaged and, and actively uh, you know, co-creating uh, the learning of the course. Under assessment and feedback, again, this gets back to the the importance of prompt um, feedback to students. I would just highlight a couple of things here. It's important to have formative assessment in your course, whether it's online or face-to-face. -face. I mean, it's one thing to have some kind of exam or project in the end of the course to show for students to show what they've learned. But formative feedback helps them to shape their learning as the course is going on. This is very easily done by putting uh, low stakes quiz activities in your Moodle course to have students continually, you know, working with the content and go, then going into one of these low stakes Moodle quizzes to, um, to have to retrieve that content. Because studies have shown that students don't learn very effectively if they just read the material over and over and over again. The way they learn, the way we all learn, is through retrieval practice. And these formative low stakes quizzes that you can put into your Moodle course, or low stakes uh, writing assignments that you put in as assignment activities, anything that gets students to retrieve and uh, reflect on what they have learned in a way that gets them feedback. And you can do that immediate feedback if you do like objective multiple choice questions in your Moodle quiz, low stakes Moodle quizzes. That um, you know that gives them that formative practice, that formative feedback that makes that lets them know I'm on track or I'm not on track or I, I I'm, I've got this topic covered, but I need to work more on this topic. So this formative feedback is is an important standard I think, as well as um, You know, clearly stating the grading policies, that's part of getting your syllabus up online. Uh, having the clear uh, uh, criteria for grading assignments, I would point everyone to the various ways that you can incorporate the use of rubrics into Moodle. You put a Moodle assignments in your course, 
rather than just grading them on a 10 point scale, you can actually design a rubric, have that rubric right there in Moodle. Let students see what the rubric is that you're going to be assessing their work on. So they actually know what they should be doing for the assignment. Um, surprise, surprise, students produce better product when they know what we want them to do. Um, and um, Moodle has a very robust grade book. If you're having um, trouble getting started with the Moodle grade book, which I know faculty can have issues getting started, um, I would just recommend that you email tltc at purchase.edu to get in touch with us. Marie will see that email and she will direct you to, she'll direct me to get in touch with you because I typically do the consultations on gradebook. Uh, but having the gradebook set up properly so that it is giving students ongoing feedback as to how they're doing the course is very important for all of our courses face to face but especially for the online courses. Um, and then, again, I would suggest you all go through these. Let me turn it over to Rebecca at this point. And uh, she can talk about some of the standards that are more directly related to accessibility. There we go. Okay, so I just wanted to talk about some of the common issues that we see in courses as you are perhaps rede redesigning a face-to-face -face course and taking it online. Um, or if you are uh, taking uh, a previous online course and refreshing it for yourself uh, using the OSCAR rubric. We did a study, how many years ago would you say? 2017, I think? Marie, myself, and Somewhere. another librarian got together and we looked at the online courses specific to um, kind of barriers that are created there and some of the problems that we had. And these are very common things that we noticed. So I'm, I'm going to provide you with a list of those. But the number one issue is, is bad scans. Uh, I just don't know what else to call them, but that's what they are. They are just bad scans. Things that don't need to be scanned, um, things that were hand scanned that are completely inaccessible, illegible, can't be re read by a screen reader. Um, these often uh, tend to be essentially pictures in PDF form, so they're extremely large file size. It takes a long time for a student to print those things out. Sometimes we'll see words cut off, coffee stains, highlighting, uh, marginalia, uh, things that you may have jotted down. Those kinds of things are really problematic in, um, in all courses, but especially in online courses where you just don't have the wiggle room that you need to communicate with students. So um, you definitely, especially because, you know, here our online courses are what, four weeks now? I think four, eight. We, four to eight weeks, um, you know, it's kind of this 15 week course compressed um, like a lump of coal into a diamond and um, this would affect your clarity. So, <laughs> so you, you really want to make sure that you're following best practices for scanning or avoid scanning altogether if you can. Um, some of the other things we see are incomplete or repetitive content. Uh, we've seen duplicate videos, duplicate links, duplicate documents, duplicate images, duplicate course announcements fields from years of importing from one Moodle to another. So this is a great time if you're really revising your course and refreshing it and, and really re revisioning it is to take a look at that content and maybe move it over manually rather than an automatic uh, import because of some of these issues. It'll allow you a little bit more control to refresh that and then going forward, you won't necessarily have the same issues. Um, inaccessible videos and images, you may um, have the privacy, the, the pin code to get into a video, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your students have it. Um, the videos also may be inaccessible from the point of disabilities and may have no captioning. So anything that you're including in your course really needs to be captioned and it needs to be properly captioned. So if you're using something that has auto-generated captioning, you really need to watch the entire thing yourself with the captions on and make sure that the captions match up. 
it doesn't have to be absolutely exact. It needs to be really good. So for example, if you, you know, we were binge watching West Wing on Netflix a couple of months ago, and uh, we noticed that the captions probably followed the script a little bit more closely than the actors did. So when the president was talking about, you know, his staff, maybe, uh, maybe the actor used the word uh, employees. So that's close enough. But a lot of auto captioning is really, really poorly done and in fact changes the meaning completely or completely jumbles up what the terms are and it can be extremely confusing to a student. Um, the chances that you're getting students who have disabilities um, may be a little bit higher in an online course, right? If they have a mobility disability, they may be more attracted to taking an online course so that they don't necessarily have to schlep onto campus and navigate everything physically. So, you want to be careful of these kinds of things. Um, inconsistent linking and broken links. You want to pick a, a, pick a pattern for linking. Moodle makes that very easy. Moodle has a URL resource that allows you to put the link in. Sometimes we see people going sort of outside of the norm and, and linking sort of rich text within the Moodle page. We don't recommend that. So you really want to try to find a way of doing it and doing it consistently throughout. Um, broken links, you need to make sure that you're checking, if you're, especially if you're importing from a previous version, you want to check everything completely. And if you're incapable of doing that just because you're too close to it, you know, let's see if we can get a peer. You can certainly contact us and we'll take a look at it. Um, but you, before you go live, you want to make sure that those issues are attended to. Um, it reflects poorly, but it also makes it difficult for people. Um, and uh, depending on their disability, this can be a debilitating thing. Outdated information, this could be policy information, it could be names of departments on campus, it could be um, current news stories that are no longer current, right? Um, and then finally, images lacking alternative text. This is particularly important in online courses, although out of, this is the most daunting, I think, Thing for faculty developing an online course. A lot of faculty are used to using um, kind of really content-rich PowerPoints, and um, the suggestion is that every image have some kind of alternative text that can be read aloud to a student who may be uh, low or no vision. Um, out of all of the accessibility issues, that is really probably the one that is the least frequency, but the most overwhelming to faculty. So one of the things that we've talked about in, in my office is really sort of inching forward and striving for progress. Make a deal with yourself that from here on out, as you create new content, you're gonna make sure that those things have alternate text. And I, again, if you're using Moodle, Moodle makes it easy. It has a description field for a reason. A lot of people have gotten in the habit of skipping by that or putting in something that's not really robust enough. Okay, let's look at the uh, highlighted standards for accessibility. What I will say is that throughout the OSCAR rubric, there are bits and pieces of accessibility, and that is what it should be. It should infuse all that we are thinking and doing, um, but I pulled out a couple that specifically may be useful for you to think about, um, and I have the numbers of those, but we can talk about um, standard 15, which is a little bit surprising perhaps, and I can navigate to it. Um, so this is, right, any technology tool meets accessibility standards, right? Why is that surprising? Well, because it really means any, right? Anything that you're employing in your class, if you're using um, some kind of social media, you wanna make sure that that meets accessibility standards. They don't all meet accessibility standards. In fact, Instagram just uh, raised its accessibility game one year ago, so, and it's been around a while. So all of these companies are catching up with this, but if you're gonna employ any of these technologies for your class, they need to be caught up already. Um, so for years, you know, Prezi was used as a presentation software. I don't know where it is now. I stopped using it because it wasn't accessible, but maybe they've caught up as well. So you wanna make sure that anything that you're asking your students to do or engage with um, is in fact accessible. And there are easy ways of doing that. You can just Google like Prezi and accessibility, 
and see where that's at. I haven't looked in a while. Maybe I'll do that later today and take, take a check. But you, it really needs to be literally any technology tool. So that's extremely important. Oh, shoot. That's, okay. fine. That's all right. Okay. So uh, we'll take a look at standard 34. Standard 34 is text content is available in an easily accessed format. So I wanted to point this out to you because people don't realize they think you know, PDF, portable document format, it sounds really accessible, but in fact, it is the least accessible format that exists. It is akin to an image. Um, and so the most accessible thing that we have access to is HTML. So the easiest way for you to provide long-term, low-maintenance access to your students is to really just make a page resource and put your information in the page resource. Um, it's even better than using Word documents. You can do that as well. That's more accessible than a PDF. It's less accessible than HTML. So um, some, some faculty have argued, I don't want to use Word because I don't know that my students have it. All your students do have access to Word or that is the expectation if they're going to be taking classes at the college. So that's less of an issue. Um, but you want to make sure that all the content is readable by assistive technology. And there are quick, simple ways of doing that. Um, when we're looking at a PDF, for example, can you, can you copy and highlight text and drop it into Notepad, for example? If you can and it reads it appropriately, then a screen reader can read it as well. If you click on a PDF and the entire thing turns blue and you can't pick up any text, then it's not gonna get read at all to any audience that needs a screen reader. So there are some simple ways of doing that that I'll review for you when, I, when we send the, the materials around for the workshop. But it is something to think about. Let's see. Why, am I, why is this getting in my way here? There we go. Okay. Um, I'm not going to bring up standard 35 because we've talked about it a little bit, but it basically says that you need a text equivalent for every non text element that's provided. So for an image that's alternative text, for a video that's captioning, for a podcast, you might want to provide a transcript. One of the nice things, as I said, that more and more places are getting um, on board with accessibility is that your big TED Talks, your BBC, your PBS, those big organizations will all have captioning or transcripts available to you. Conversely, the little guys, the local TEDx conference in you know, Paducah may not have captioning available, right? It's a budget issue. So you wanna be careful about adding those kinds of things. Um, standard 36, oh, what I would also say for standard 35, a text equivalent for every non-text element, is that this also includes, uh, when we talk about images, graphs, tables, data, and people often don't think about that. They think that the data in the tab table speaks for itself, but in fact, the table may not be set up that way. So you definitely need to make sure header rows are, um, are designated, columns are designated, and that the entire table is described with some kind of alternate text. Okay. Standard 36, this is sort of another design issue. Um, we see, unfortunately, a lot of faculty using color to make meaning. For example, important, read this in red. Um, you definitely want to stay away from that. Um, if somebody has red-green color blindness, blindness, they're gonna miss your message. And if it's really that important, you don't want them to do that. So there are other ways of going about it. You could put an asterisk, um, you could bold text. You, there are other ways of calling out text besides just using color. Um, so you definitely don't want it to be your primary method for delivering information um, ever. So if you have it, you just definitely want to get rid of it. Why is that coming up? Okay. 
hyperlinks. So if you notice on this document here that I was just working off of, hyperlinks have to be descriptive and make sense out of context. If I go back to my Google Doc, you'll see that it doesn't just say click here, right? It says Oscar standard 37, Oscar standard 36, so that it's clear. You should never have a link spelled out with HTTP colon slash slash unless you are presenting in front of an audience at that moment. So um, for your courses, you, most likely it'll be asynchronous. You're going to want to stay away from spelling out a link that way. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Nobody wants to hear HTTP colon slash slash ww right you just want me to stop so, so um, it's a it's a good reminder that to get rid of those as well don't use click here avoid under construction those kinds of things coming soon etc and then finally and I think that this is probably one of the most important issues is we really, um, we talked about creating a, a community of learners. When he talked about the, that community of inquiry, you've got the social presence, the cognitive presence, and the teaching presence. We talked about the importance of active learning. We talked about the importance of problem-based learning. You need to encourage your students to follow accessibility best practices as well. If you are engaging in any of these things and truly creating a community, your students may be workshopping each other's work. They might be looking at each other's papers. They might be working on a particular tool together. They might be um, ingesting information from each other's social media accounts. And if they're not doing that in a way that follows accessibility best practices, they're SOL, they're out of the game, they're not in the loop, and that breaks down your community. So one of the things we are starting to talk about is kind of how to be a digital ally. And I think it's important for faculty as well to remind students. So it may be worth putting a little note, especially if you're, you know, if you're teaching an online class in your syllabus that says, we expect the following in terms of best practices. And I can give you that kind of lingo, but it would be making sure you have alternate text or that if you're grouping videos together, those videos are properly captioned. That um, if you're scanning things, you're doing it in a way that's accessible, et cetera. Um, so I think that's about as fast as I could go. I know it was a lot of information in a short period of time. We're running kind of low on time, so thank you. So I would just, um... I just want to pull up one other standard and then we can wrap things up here under assessment and feedback. There is to make sure that you are providing accommodations on assessments for those students who need accommodations. And so if you are doing those low stakes quizzes in Moodle, for example, do realize that if some student needs time and a half on testing, for example, it's easy to set up a user override in quiz uh, activity to, to give that student that extra time. So, you know, just in general, I think uh, SUNY's done a great job in putting this rubric together. There are not only uh, a, a nice set of standards that will help you design and deliver your course, but every one of the standards has all of these different re resources, the faculty perspective, the uh, rationale, the tips for how you can apply that in your course. So I would just encourage you all to, uh, to get into the OSCAR site, uh, explore, figure out maybe which of those standards you want to concentrate on this to go around on your course and work on those. I mean, there are 50 standards. You don't necessarily have to make sure that you- um, You'll never you, launch your course. <laughs> you touch your course with every single one right. of them. Uh, I've been kind of looking at the chat as we've been going through. It's been, um, I don't know that there are any questions, Marie. Uh, if you do have questions about the Oscar rubric, uh, you know, please do just email tltc at purchase.edu and uh, we can get them, we can get to them, to you about them. If it's an accessibility question, we'll forward it on to Rebecca. And uh, let us know how you're, um, how you're taking this tool and applying it to your course. 
And remember that we're available to help you kind of audit yes. as well. If you want right. somebody to take a look at your course and make sure you don't have some of these pitfalls in there yes. and um, make sure that it is as accessible yeah. as you want it to be. Yeah, we've, we have not required, uh, for example, Oscar rubric audits of courses, but certainly if you would like a second pair of eyes on your course, uh, let us know and we can take the Oscar rubric and look over your course with it. Well, thanks everyone for joining this morning. Um, I'm going to uh, close down the recording at this point.